Well, good morning. If you want to start turning your Bibles to the Romans 15th chapter, Romans chapter 15. Ever since I was pretty young, I was always told to set goals. I started out with a man named Doug Bryant. I was in sixth grade and he was our Pee Wee coach and he was reminding us to set goals. Uh, for our future life, and he ended up passing away that year of heart attack. And we move on to my junior year, we have Jeff Lewis, which some teachers may know him. He's a principal at Jasper now, and he was always reminding us to set uh, goals for our life. And then moving on from him was Steve Blanche, which I'd say many of you know who that is from Bourbon. And he came to Jasper, and he reminded us to set goals for our future life. And as a teenager, normally you don't listen to what older people have to say. Most teenagers don't. But then later in life, they start to remember those things that they were told, the things that they were taught, and they start to apply them to their life. And so when we went to preaching school, when we went to seminary, I set a goal. And a goal was to make a 90 average for the two total years, and I made 89.98. So I was pretty close to achieving that goal. Well, if you knew me in high school, I averaged like a D straight across the board because I was just ready to get out of that place. So I set a higher standard. And I think that's something important is that when you achieve a goal, you set a higher goal and you try to fulfill it. Uh, I was listening to a couple of these motivational speakers talking to younger children, children, and they said the first thing you need to do when you wake up is to make a bed. And the kid asked, well, why do I need to make my bed? So you start the day out with an accomplishment. Oh, well, that's a pretty good idea. But when I get up, I get up pretty early. I still got my wife and I still got two little children in the bed. So I can't really make the bed. So I kind of flop my side over where it looks kind of nice. So I start my day off like that. And I, and I got the feeling, man, I accomplished something. First thing off the list. That's a good feeling to have. And so when we were in school, it seemed like every other day there was a preacher that was stopping by and they came to a school of preaching to talk to preachers about preaching. Over and over. We just heard about preaching and preaching. I was so ready to hear something else. And so now when I go up to the school, I don't even deal with preaching. They, they hear it every day. They hear, you need to preach, you need to preach, you need to preach. Oh, you need to live. You need to have a life. When you have a family, you can't just focus just on <coughs> preaching. You gotta be a husband, you gotta be a father. And so now when I get the chance to go up there, I do talk about goals. I talk about goals in your personal life as well as your spiritual life and how important they are to fulfill those things. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, setting goals. And this is a lesson that can apply to any age, whether it's children or whether it's somebody who is well advanced in age. And so we think about goals, you have some. Whether you have them wrote down or whether you have them in your mind, you have goals that you want to achieve. When you get married and, and you're in that puppy love stage, you want to, you're want you ready to have that baby. I know the Coopers are ready to have a baby. Now, it's due on my birthday, so you better push it out on that day. <laughs> so you got goals and you do what it takes to achieve those goals. And that's just part of life. But the process of achieving could take a long time or it can take a short time. So we have to have patience and we have to have perseverance. And so in Romans chapter 15, one of the things we need to have a goal of, and these are some of my goals, and I think we all can probably relate to these goals, uh, you may have some differences. I'm always eager to teach. I'm always, whether it's in public, whether it's here, whether it's Bible class, I'm eager to teach. I'm eager to talk about Scripture. And, and I do a lot of talking when I get started on it. Uh, yesterday I had the chance to play in a disc golf tournament at North Art. And it was packed. There was 100 people to, uh, at the course. And so I got a chance to be on a car with four other people. And I yacked and yacked all day long about Scripture. They didn't even like it. I just kept on and kept on. And so I, I'm always eager to teach. In Romans 15 and the 20th verse, Romans chapter 15 and verse 20, it says, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should, be, should, lest I should build on another man's foundation. There was not another gospel preacher there yesterday. 
There wasn't someone else tag teaming with me, and we were going to different areas of that tournament to try to teach. I made it my aim to teach somebody the gospel. Somebody was going to hear the name of Christ, whether it was there, whether it was when I got gas, whether it was when I went and got ice cream. Someone was going to hear the name of Jesus, somehow, some way. And so yesterday I made it my aim. That's an aim we must have every day. We have teachers in here that are in the presence of the next generation. Make it your aim to teach those children. I know that you've got guidelines and so on, but there's a way around it. There always is. And this is a, an area that is so important. We have people that are in the public eye. Make it your aim to teach the gospel. Now, I'm not going to be offended if you come where I am teaching. We'll just tag team it out and we'll try to teach more. But here it's talking about building on another man's foundation. I don't think I'm going to get, I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get frustrated about that. I don't think nobody would. But make it your aim to teach. Isaiah chapter 6 Isaiah the 6th chapter, and we have a psalm in our hymnal with these same exact words. But Isaiah chapter 6, I didn't hear much of the Old Testament when I first became a Christian. And so when we went to school, we studied a lot of these books. And for some reason, this is always stuck in my mind. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. This is the Lord talking to Isaiah. And we'll start in verse 6. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand the live coal which he had taken with his tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard a voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom shall go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell the people. So we should always be eager to teach, eager to go. Uh, sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes you're not going to want to do it, but it could be the greatest thing that you could do that day is to tell just one person. And that one person can start thinking and tell another person. And then you got a chain reaction. It's a great thing. And many of you have been around long enough in the church. You've seen that happen. You've seen you talk to one person, that person talk to another, and all of a sudden you're in a Bible study. You know exactly that feeling. And how amazing it is. And the last verse I want to read on this section is comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, what was me if I don't preach the gospel? Now, this is from Paul's perspective. This doesn't mean that if you don't preach, what was you? And I've never found a positive woe in Scripture. It's always followed up by something negative. But Paul says to himself, woe is me if I don't do this. Now, when reading this, I felt that same uh, feeling. That if I don't do this, woe is me. Because I feel like that God's given the ability to do such things. We all have a different work in the kingdom. Every one of us have a different area of expertise. But there's always areas that we can grow and be better on. And so we have some that want to stand up and teach, but maybe they just don't have the nerve. Well, God, is, if you're striving, God's going to cause those things to be fulfilled in due time. And so if you have this feeling when you read this verse, like, woe is me, that's probably something that you're going to be great at in the kingdom, in the church, is teaching. And so we need to make it an aim to teach. We need to make that part of our daily Christian lives is to find a way to teach. Whether it's by the way you treat your wife, people recognize that. People recognize the way you treat your wife or the way the wife treats the husband. When the wife's not around and she's not bad about her husband, that's a great thing in this world today. And vice versa with the husband and the wife. And then the uh, parents talking about their children, uh, bad about their children. You know, you can set examples in many different ways, and you just need to find that way to teach those who are around you. Because, I mean, you think about it, and you be honest, I mean, non-Christians outnumber the Christians. When you go out, and you go out in public, you're surrounded by more non-Christians than there are Christians. We have examples to set, and those examples are a great way of teaching. A great way. Now next, I just call it simple living. 
And it comes from 1 Thessalonians. Simple living. At this tournament yesterday, there's a man named Herman. He's from Mountain View. He's 62 years old, and last year he got second place. He's a phenomenal player, and I got the chance to play with him once again. Wonderful man. Wonderful man. And he remembered me, uh, not really by look. It was by what we were talking about last year. It was sheep. Somehow, some way, he, he remembered me as the sheep person. And so we got to talking again, and we kind of got to talking about religion. And he's a very religious man, but we just don't see eye to eye on certain things. And that's sad when, when you have a lot of things in common, and all of a sudden just one thing just messes it all up. And it's only one thing that people will not budge from, and it's salvation. They will not budge from maybe it's grace only, maybe it's works only, maybe it's faith only. A lot of people, they won't budge on that. And so we got to talking uh, the whole round, the second round for 20 holes. We talked nothing about salvation. It was a blessing. But he left and he still had the same mind. And so if you have a time this day, pray for a man in Herman from Mountain View that may be something stuck uh, from the gospel. But I call this simple living. We talked about how simple uh, life is, actually is, and how we just make it really hard. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, sorry, we'll start here in verse 9. For you that have, I know some of you are not raising children at the moment, but you've got your grandbabies around you. And you have a chance to, to teach some valuable lessons. Here is a section of scripture to teach. Here is a section of scripture for them to be raised upon. It's found here in 1 Thessalonians 4, and we'll start here in verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. I mean, how, that, that's a compliment. Paul didn't have to really write about brotherly love because they had it now. I mean, we got to think about putting our congregation in these congregation's shoes. Do we have that type of love? Where if somebody was trying to help us, they didn't have to mention that. He said, I don't have to write to you concerning that. You have it now. I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, verse 10, you do so towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. So not only in Thessalonica, they were spreading this love across the borders. I and mean, they were going around and they were loving on their brethren. And it was known, it was known from Paul. And so, from Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Can we ever do enough? Can we ever learn enough? Can we ever love enough? Can we ever teach enough? No. Always more and more. And what a valuable lesson to teach the young children today is always achieve more. Always do more. Don't set a cap on expectation. Just keep on grinding, as a lot of people are saying today. Just keep on pushing and keep on persevering. Brethren, that you increase more and more. Verse 11, that you also inspire to lead a quiet life. If you evaluate your home, is it a quiet home? I'm not talking about just you guys talking to one another. But are you quiet at home? Do you just kind of stick to your business and get things done that you need to get done? Or do you go over to your neighbor's house and tell them what they need to get done? What type of house do you have? You know, we have a pretty quiet house, and I like it that way. I like not being able to see my neighbor's house. It's wonderful. It's a joy. Not that I don't like my neighbor's. I just like being secluded. I love where I live. National Forest touches all the property. So I'm not worried about someone just coming up in my backyard besides an animal. But we did have a couple of lost hikers come up through the field. That was a weird day. But other than that, you know, I like being secluded. And you've learned that about me. I like a secluded household. But I don't mind to get out and talk. And I think, you know, I don't mind to talk uh, to people. So live a quiet life to mind your own business. <laughs> this is a big one. Mind your own business. You know, that's a big issue. Now, if it's a spiritual matter, I'm probably going to get in your business. Not mean, not judgmental, but we need to try to help each other there. If you see me struggling, help me get picked back up and go forward. Please do so. Do it nicely. Don't be all mean and snotty about it. And I won't do the same to you. But mind your business. Live your life and try to achieve what you need to achieve. Now, if someone wants you to help in their life, help and aid them. 
But don't stick your nose in people's business. To mind your own business and to work with your own hands. As we command you that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. So this is a, it goes both ways. We're trying to help the brethren and we're also trying to help those outside. We're trying to set, the, set that example of love Set that example that we're not meddling in each other's businesses, and that's going to impact those who are outside and to the point where we, do, where we don't lack nothing. And so I call this section a simple life, and it is simple, to be quiet, to live a quiet life, a life of no gossip, Philippians chapter 2. This is a big area, is gossip. You turn on the news, what is it? It's gossip on somebody else. Uh, all I hear is gossip on Donald Trump. <laughs> they can't stand the man, I guess. <laughs> I think that's pretty easy to see. But we live in a world where people talk about other people. People feed off of talking about other people. And if you listen to my lesson Wednesday, I talked about people that will do whatever it takes for you to have a bad day. Whether it's a co-worker and they see your life is going good, you have a good marriage, they'll try to make your day horrible. There's people out there that will do so. And so people feed off gossip. They just wake up and they're trying to find something to talk about to somebody else. So Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. You know, we're supposed to have each other's backs. That's what I really get from this particular verse, is we have each other's backs. I'm going to be invested in your interest spiritually and physically if you want me to, and if I ask you to do the same, I expect you to do the same. Uh, we are supposed to be family. Family helps one another. Uh, my mother-in-law had three to $400 stolen from her one time. And so what would the family do? We got money together and we replenished it for her. We're family. That's what we do. We should do that here. And I have high expectations of this congregation. You know, when I first came here, I already felt family. I felt that energy. And I still feel it to this day. You know, that's important that we have each other's backs, and that should always be a goal for a congregation, is that we're always there for one another. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I would encourage you to write these down if you would just like a copy of this. These are, in my strong opinion, these are some important verses for the moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we'll start here in verse 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 11, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies, busy bodies, people look over that verse a lot, people look over that word a lot, this word is not positive, nothing comes out of it good out of the busybody when talked about in scripture. Now we can apply busybody to today for someone who works really hard for their family, who's trying to get all the bills and pay ends meet and so on. But that's not what it talks about in scripture. This is a person that just has nothing else to do but go to house to house and talk about other people. Instead of doing what they're supposed to do, they're doing everything else. This is a busybody. Now this is not a good thing to be. Now look at 1 Peter just for a second. 1 Peter chapter 4. And you probably ran across when studying busybodies before, and I never found where it is a positive thing to be. So don't be it. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's start here in verse 14. 1 Peter 4. And we'll start here in verse 14. I want you to notice how bad a busybody actually is. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of the glory of glory and of God rest upon you. Make sure I'm in the right section. Yeah. Verse 14. If, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit, spirit of the glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is uh, a blaspheme, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody. You see what kind of category a busybody's in? Murderer, Thief, don't be a busybody. 
Don't worry about sticking your nose in other people's businesses if it's not asked. Now, if there's a dire situation that could save your life, okay, fine, meddle in that person's business and save your life. But don't just do it because you're bored and you have nothing else to do. Don't talk to other people about people if, if people now have turned that into a hobby. And so God has put this in the category as murderers, thief, and evildoers, or as a busybody in other people's matters. I mean, what a group of people to be listed in. Don't be that person. Don't be a busybody. Now, instead of being a busybody, learn how to labor. Now look at Ephesians 4, verse 28. There is plenty of work that can be done in and outside God's kingdom. If you have plenty of work to do just at your own home. You can probably think of 10 things right now that need to get done at your house. That can just be inside the house. Then there's probably a lot that can be done outside the house. That doesn't even count if you've got a junk shed that's just full of tools and full of junk laying around. That's how you count the barn that may need to be cleaned. There's plenty of stuff that you can actually be doing. And then you have in the kingdom. How much work is there in the church? Endless. Because we can't reach all people. So part of the work of the church is to convert, is, is to teach. And so there's always work that we can be doing. So instead of being a busybody uh, for self-pleasure or, or, or for selfishness, find a way to be a busybody for the work of Christ. So Ephesians, the fourth chapter, look at verse 28. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. So we have a work, whether it's a physical labor or whether it's a spiritual labor, there's work that needs to be done. Now, I didn't read this a moment ago, you don't have to turn back there. You probably looked at it. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We were just there a second ago. If I want to read this verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. You think people need to read this over and over again? If you don't work, you don't eat. It's not counting disabilities, mental disabilities, people with cancer. And, well, I think common sense tells you the list of people that can't work. But are there lazy people that will not work? Guess what they should do? They should starve. Why? Because when they get so hungry, they'll go looking for a job. People standing on the street corner that will not work, that can work. Because I know I know of so many jobs hiring right now, they could go get a job. They don't care about tattoos, they don't care about your appearance, they don't care how you smell. As long as you can swing a hammer or you can lay some shingles, you can find a job. But what do they do? They're making a killing sitting on the corner. And I know they're making a killing or they wouldn't go back out. They're making good money. Well, God's policy is if you don't work, you starve. And so we shouldn't have all these bailouts. I'm in completely disagreement with lazy people getting bailed. They should starve because while they're starving, they're going to think, man, I could get a job and eat some food. That's the lesson from God. And so God tells us what should we be doing is working because those who work will eat. Those who work, they will have a sense of pride. For those who have built the smallest, littlest thing, doesn't it feel good to get it done? Last night about 10 o'clock, me and Cheyenne put together a trampoline. Boy, I felt pretty good when that thing was over. I built Jed a little clubhouse. I felt good on the house and beating my chest and saying, look what I made. But there's a sense of pride when you get that done. God wants us to be workers because when you get something done, you want to move on to something else. How many of you have half projects laying around? I think we all can raise our hands. We got something laying around that you probably will never get it done. But we have those other things we get done most of the time. And so God wants us to be workers. Now, the last section here I want to look at on goals is to please God. We were told over and over again while I was at school, these preachers that would keep coming in and try to motivate us basically not to quit because they knew how hard it was. 
they come in and they talk about goals and so on, and they told us to always remind yourself, your family, and the congregation about goals. Whether it's a financial goal, whether it's a missionary goal, whatever it may be, just set a goal and try to achieve that goal. And I can remember it's the preacher from the Sparta Church of Christ in Missouri. I'm having a lack of trouble on his name right now. But one of the things he taught us every time that he came was to aim to please God. He said, that should be on the top of your list, is to always try to please God. And it's pretty simple to please God because of the law that we have. He didn't make it where you have to have a certain bloodline. He didn't make it where you have to go somewhere three, four times a year. He didn't make it where you have to go and buy animals to sacrifice. He made it simple. He made it simple because he desires all men to be saved. And so it's simple. We can understand what it takes to please God but it needs to still be a goal. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And for that section, for those who take notes on the labors, write down Matthew chapter 20 and the first verse that follow. And that is the parable of a vineyard and how Jesus has hired people to go out into his vineyard and to be workers, to be laborers. And that's an important parable of the study. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians the 5th chapter. And we'll start here at verse 9. 2 Corinthians 5 we'll start at verse 9. Therefore we make it our aim, whether in present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So when we understand judgment, we understand the fear and the terror of the Lord, what do we try to do? We try to tell others about that. I mean, that would be pretty selfish for you to understand judgment and then keep it to yourself. There's other people that's going to face this day and he says, it is my aim to be well-pleasing to God. It is my aim to let people know about this, to persuade men. But we are well-known to God. I also trust that we are known in your conscience. So you think about the persuade men. Many of you have been to a car dealership, and what do they try to do with that new car? They try to get you to buy it. They'll offer all kinds of deals, uh, whether it's, you know, they'll take your car and they'll, and they'll buy it for a higher price. I mean, they know what they're doing. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to persuade you to buy this car. And they won't let it go until you literally just have to leave. You know, that should be the, not the intensity, but our attitude when dealing with men of the world. We should try to do whatever it takes to get them to obey that gospel. And that's why it's good to be a student of the word is to know how to persuade people. Here, Paul says to persuade men because of the judgment that is coming. And that's also why we are trying to be pleasing to God is because we understand the day of judgment and what it actually holds. Because I, I listen to a lot of these comedians and a lot of them are real funny, but they all kind of have the same idea. I can do whatever I want and say whatever I want now. And at the end, I can just ask God to forgive me. Because that's the whole message of the gospel. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is to live a faithful life. And then when that day of judgment comes, he will evaluate that life. And he will give you the great day of entrance or the great day of denial. It's not something you just do at that moment. It's something, it's a lifelong action of being a Christian. It's something that you are. And it is a verb. A Christian is not a noun, it's a verb, it's an action that you are. You are like Christ. And so people that have that mentality need to be corrected. And so we want to please God because, one, the rewards of heaven, the rewards of that home, uh, the rewards of that destination, and also for judgment. We want to be pleasing to God because of that. That's why this is an important goal uh, to have. So Acts chapter 17 i got a couple more verses, but I want to end on this verse here. Acts 17, verse 31. And for those who are big note takers, I'm glad to give you what I have. I didn't read, there's about 37 verses. That's a lot to take in in one lesson. So, Acts 17, verse 31. 
I'd say if any of you have an underline, probably under this section here, Acts 17, verse 31. Because he is appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to, of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so we have a day. Do we know the day? No. In uh, Timothy, it talks about that day is coming as a thief in the night. We will never be prepared for that day. And we can be prepared spiritually, but physically, we're not going to be ready for it. We don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus himself, he's told us that he does not know the hour. Only the Father in heaven. Have you met someone that's, that's, that believes in people that believe they know the day that Jesus is going to return? You tell them that they're smarter than Christ himself. Christ does not even know the hour which he is going to return. Why? I don't know. I wasn't there in that discussion that the Father had with the Son. It says only the Father in heaven knows the hour in which the Son of Man will come. And so that day is a great day. It is a great day, and that's weird to say that, but it's a great day for those who are prepared. Because we know what lies past judgment day. We know there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And if there's no condemnation, you're not going to be negatively judged. That's the great thing about being a Christian. It's judgment day. It's just a passing, as many people say, it's passing over the Jordan River to get to the promised land, which Israel had to do. And so you think about these goals. One, eager to teach. It can be scary. You can get them butterflies that make you want to get everywhere. But whatever it is, find a way to teach. Good example. Husband, the way you treat your wives. Wives, the way you treat your husband sets a great example. And the way the parents treat their children and the way the children behave set a great example. Uh, you being in your workplace, uh, whether it's just blessing your food, Whatever it is, people notice everything you do. People watch, especially when they know that you're a Christian. They really watch everything that you do. So set that great example. That is a great way to teach. And then live simple. Mind your own business as God has commanded and that you are workers with your hands. We've got plenty of things that we need to get done. We don't need a medal in other people's lives. Unless they ask us. And spiritually, I want people to help me. You're not going to ever offend me if I'm lacking somewhere and you help me. And most Christians won't be. It's all the way you approach that person. You can really shut them down. And lastly, make a goal to please God. Always. Teach those young kids to try to learn the faith of God and to please God. And you yourself have a goal to please Him. One, because of the reward that He has promised and because of that great day of judgment. So we have a song prepared for those who have a spiritual need. Uh, we'll even uh, hear out physical needs and try to fulfill them as well. Uh, we here at the Bergman Church of Christ desire that all men, as well as God, desires all will come to repentance and come to the knowledge of truth. So come now as together we stand and we say.